So I'm about to head in to see Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny of all the movies coming out this year. This is the one with the highest potential to just break my heart. I love Harrison Ford. I love Indiana Jones. I love James Mangold. There's so many things about this movie that could make me love it but I don't trust Lucasfilm right now. And so I'm going into this movie very nervous. We all know what happened with Kingdom of the Crystal Schools. I'm not really sure where I will land on this film. I'm sure there'll be highs. I'm not sure how low the lows will be. I am so anxious. I'm so excited. I'm about to see it and I'll let you know what I thought about it. My name is Sean and I love to talk about movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comments section. Let me know what did you think about Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny? My thoughts aren't the right thoughts. They're just my thoughts and I would love to hear yours and please keep it respectful down below in the comments section. If you loved it, awesome. If you felt betrayed by it, I'm sorry about that. Wherever you fall, please just be respectful to one another. Also, I've been working through reviewing all of the older Indiana Jones films leading up to this movie. I actually didn't get them all completed in time. You can check those out in this playlist right up here. And also I did a video back seven years ago on how to fix Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skulls. It's a very different type of video from me. You can check that out also right up here. And let's get started talking about the good. And I'll just cut right to the chase with this one. This one is safely right there in the middle. It comes nowhere close to the highs of the original trilogy from the 80s, but it also doesn't approach the embarrassing loads of nuking the fridge and swinging with the monkeys. It delivers a lot of what you want from it in an Indiana Jones film, while at the same time having quite a few things that don't fully work, or maybe they never were gonna work in the first place because it doesn't match the franchise and what the audiences expect from it. So what's great about the film? Of course, Harrison Ford is fantastic as Indiana Jones. And this is just one of the classic examples of perfect casting where all of his strengths, his charm, his smirk, his humor, his physicality, match perfectly with the Indiana Jones character. And even with the limitations of his age, he was 80 years old now, he still absolutely has got it. He can be funny, he's got the smirks, all of the stuff that you want from Indiana Jones, you still get it out of this performance. And this is a, a much older Harrison Ford and a story that has kind of a, a melancholy core to it. And so, probably his most emotional and passionate performance as Indiana Jones. And so like, it's tough to say it's his best performance because he was perfection in Raiders, Last Crusade. He's so funny as the action guy. This movie has a little bit more emotional depth to it of where he has to go with the character. So in that regard, it could be his best performance from a acting thespian standpoint. And obviously, he loses something and not being able to move like he used to. So it's tough to really compare them. But from pure like acting where he has to go emotionally, this is the most potent his performance has been as Indiana Jones. From there, James Mangold is taking over as the director from Steven Spielberg. Now, I, I've said it many times before, Steven Spielberg is my favorite director of all time. He is an absolute legend. He's phenomenal at directing action, adventure. He invented blockbusters as we know them, at least from my perspective. So when he ended up not directing this project, and they brought in James Mangold, there's always gonna be concern there. I don't think there's anyone that's the obvious one-to-one -one new modern day Steven Spielberg. I don't think anyone is in that category, but James Mangold has a pretty fantastic track record. He has a very diverse filmography. He's done all kinds of different genres. The movie he did before this was Ford vs. Ferrari, which is a film that it's fun, it's exciting, but it also has some big emotions in it. And then he's done modern day Westerns. He's done real Westerns. He's done comic book movies. He's done dramas. He's kind of done it all. And most of them have been really good. So bringing him in, 
you know that you're getting someone that is a competent director that can tell a story. And I think you see that with this film, that it's competently constructed, sequences have energy, they have emotion, they have humor. They It hits all the beats that it's supposed to have. As you're watching an Indiana Jones, what do you want from it? You want globetrotting, you want adventure, you want spectacle, you want humor. And that specifically that old fashioned kind of humor that these movies are famous for, you get all of that with this movie. James Mangold knows how to deliver, knows how to construct a film, knows how to run a set. And so you have a competently made film. The other thing this movie kind of adds to the franchise is that it does have this deeply emotional, sad core where you're seeing Indiana Jones at a very different phase of life. And so it just brings in some emotions that we haven't really seen in this franchise before. And if a movie is supposed to thrill you, excite you, make you laugh and make you feel things, this movie does that. It delivers a, a lot of different emotions and experiences as you're watching it. And just in general, it's good to see Indiana Jones one more time. In particular, as you do the cold open that's set during World War II, Indiana Jones, very famous for not liking Nazis and killing a whole lot of them. And in this film, we get Indiana Jones in, the, in World War II, towards the end of it, battling Nazis, kind of continuing so much of what was going on in Raiders, as well as Last Crusade, and kind of seeing the final batch of these things that Hitler was trying to track down. And so you feel like you're watching this lost Indiana Jones episode, and it's fun, it's cool, it's exciting, and it reminds you of all those movies that I've been watching my entire lifetime. Now, I love my criticisms of CGI and things like that, but it's nice to get one more little adventure with classic era Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones. And then just in general, spending more time with him. And even with like Sala showing up just a little bit in here. And to be clear, it's, she's just a cameo. There's not much more of him in the film than is in the trailers. The trailers dramatically oversold his presence in this film. There's literally only seconds more of him in this movie than what you see in the trailers. Uh, so if you're looking for a lot of him, that's not what this movie is, but just kind of getting a reminder. So I had fun watching it. It made me laugh. It made me feel things. And I got the nostalgia feels. But this is very far away from being classic era Indiana Jones. So let's move on to the mixed aspects of the film. And the big thing here is sad Indiana Jones. Lucasfilm loves to take the heroes of my childhood and bring them back at a point in time in life where they're broken, filled with regrets, reclusive, pulled away from everyone and a shadow of their former selves. So most infamously, Luke in The Last Jedi where he's off on an island by himself, literally tossing his lightsaber over his shoulder. And for me, I was highly critical of Last Jedi for that reason. And I just think it was too big of a leap from where we last saw Luke to where they reveal him to be in The Last Jedi. So I could just never fully buy into it for how big of a transformation it was. And when it comes to this movie, it where they have Indy at the beginning of the movie, feels much more believable. I don't feel like it's necessarily a leap to get him to where he's at in light of what we know about him, the age that he's at. It, it doesn't feel like out of nowhere that it was just off-putting, but at the same time, do I want to see Indiana Jones in this phase of life? Do I want to see Indiana Jones in a place like this? And that's where it's kind of conflicted on this one because I think some of the most interesting character work in the movie that takes Indiana Jones from just being pure fantasy, brings him into reality of what, what do people actually face in life as they get older. And playing that out with this adventurer who did all these amazing things and then now he's later in life and feels like it's all in the past. There's some things in there that are new to the franchise and kind of interesting. And as I mentioned before, bring emotions to this franchise that have never been there before. And at the same time, does Indiana Jones being 80 serve the franchise? The fantasy of Indiana Jones, the escapism of Indiana Jones 
is this intelligent, handsome man going off on these adventures where he's always in over his head, stumbling into scenario after scenario where he just barely survives and escapes all of it. He gets the girl and maybe he doesn't get to keep the artifact, but he's triumphant. He survives in the end, despite all of the chaos that ensues. There's a fantasy to that that's just pure escapism and it's detached from reality intentionally. That's why I watch it, because it's not like my mundane life. And so the idea of like, let's take Indiana Jones and bring him back down to life. And what would he deal be dealing with as an 80? Well, I guess the character's only 70. Harrison Ford is 80, but the character's 70 in the movie. What would he be dealing with a 70 year old man facing retirement the rest of his life and friends moving on, passing all these things? There's some emotion there, but also that's not what I signed up for with this franchise. That's not the fantasy that I go to these movies for. I go for this dude in his prime that, man, I'd love to be him. That would be so cool to be Indiana Jones killing Nazis, globetrotting, finding things, not a, a sad man in his apartment, you know, drinking booze in the morning with his coffee. That's not the fantasy. And but at the same time, I, I've said it many times before, I love to see characters at different phases of life where you get to kind of dive in and explore who they were and what they've turned into. And there's this great video on Channel Awesome talking about um, Raiders of the Lost Character arc about Indiana Jones's journey and how he kind of transforms throughout the original trilogy of films. If you watch it actually in chronological order of everything that takes place, very fascinating stuff. And then this is kind of like a, almost a bookend if you stop and think about that journey that he's been on to see like him as a character, not just the adventure, but the person there. There's some stuff that I do like about that. And this is the most vulnerable, the most intimate that we've really seen him. And you absolutely got some of that vulnerability with his father in Last Crusade and you get a touch of that, but then you get this whole other side of him. And so you get to see the real Indy. There's a lot of things about that that are really cool and enjoyable and satisfying and interesting in a new way. But does it break the fantasy of the escapism that I signed up for for this franchise? To an extent, I think it does. And even as we get into the negatives, some of the negatives come about because an 80-year-old trying to do what 40-year-old Harrison Ford was doing doesn't fully work. And so I, like I look at this movie and if you're going to make a movie about an 80 year old Indy or 70 year old Indiana Jones with an 80 year old Harrison Ford, this is probably about as good as it can get. And it delivers as about as much as you can expect from that. But should you make a movie about an, a 70 year old Indiana Jones? I don't know that that ever really serves the franchise and what people want from these movies primarily. Superficially, you get the action, the excitement, but the fantasy element to it of the guy every dude wants to be, the guy every girl wants to be with, that exciting adventure gets broken in the process at the same time. So there's like so mixed on my feelings and emotions on it because it does kind of something different. I see the character in a new light. I just don't know that that serves the franchise. From there, let's move on to the bad. And right off the bat, I don't think the Phoebe Waller Bridge character worked in this movie at all. And not really for the reasons the internet has been making videos about for a while. It's not really that, but she's written to be so smug and condescending towards Indiana Jones that for the first like two thirds of this movie, she's deeply unlikable because us as the audience are very invested in Indiana Jones. We really like him. We look up to him. We have been watching his movies, his exciting adventures our entire lives, in my case, for over 30 years now. So then when a character comes along and talks down to him, him, makes fun of him, puts him in danger. I just don't like that person because I like Indiana Jones. And even beyond that, like she makes choices throughout the first half of the film that lead to innocent people dying that are related, connected to, to Indy. And so she does deeply immoral things and doesn't care and is flippant about it. And she's trying to be like affable and charming and funny 
but I'm just thinking to myself, well, she's like a really bad person. I'm not rooting for her at all. And that is kind of her character arc that they, they give her, that she's supposed to be that way at the beginning so she could change by the end. But they push it so far to such an extent of putting Indy in danger, putting his life in danger, his reputation on the line, causing other people to die, and just being a jerk in general, that I just can't buy into this character. I didn't like her at all in a way that mild tweaks to the script and all of a sudden you have someone that is likable, that is someone that you're rooting for, but you understand their perspective on Indy and here uh, she was just like, I, I think what they were going for was she's supposed to be kind of like a young Indiana Jones that is just thinking about the fortune and glory, but it, it doesn't really work in the context under which they're doing this and the things she does are just so cruel and evil and immoral at the beginning that you just lose the audience right off the bat. Other gigantic one here, and I've been saying this ever since they announced some of the things that they were doing, the CGI and green screen, I don't think serve this franchise. That in order to bring us to World War II, you have to do this de-aged Harrison Ford. And as amazing as it looks in a certain sense, it still isn't quite there and you're watching it in still frames, you're like, that's remarkable. And at the same time, you're like, the motion still isn't quite right. There's still a deadness in the eyes and the lighting in certain, like certain lighting, it looks good. And then the next shot as the light changes, it looks bad. And I think about this movie for as much spectacle and all the car chases and on top of trains and planes, none of it is, is memorable or is exciting as the classic stuff from the original trilogy that was with practical effects and people being dragged under cars and actual model work, where here you're just watching it and it feels like so many other modern day blockbusters with um, green screen, face swapping, very advanced cartoons. And it kind of breaks that fantasy once again. And that's one of the costs. If you want to bring back an 80 year old man to do an adventure movie like this, well, you can't have him doing a lot of these things. So it's all visual effects and your brain can just tell enough. And even as filmmakers, as soon as they kind of like go all, like we got to do face swapping, well, as long as we're face swapping, we might as well do this. You just tr tr make choices all along the way that make it feel dramatically different and less visceral and less anchored in reality than what we got back in the original films. Another thing you have to talk about here is just too long that it definitely drags a little bit in the middle and your mind starts to wander. And it, I don't know what it is about modern day blockbusters that just everything keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And everyone declares that Raiders is like a perfect adventure film and Last Crusade, a fantastic follow up. And then this is 20, 30 minutes longer. And you go, what? <laughs> If you're trying to be like those movies, why don't you try and match the pacing of those movies? And part of the reason they worked is that they're not just these epic long blockbusters. You just feel like tighten the whole thing up. Just shrink, tighten it up. It doesn't have to be this long. And the last thing to talk about here is the finale, which definitely gets a little weird and wacky. I don't think it's as out there as aliens, interdimensional beings, whatever you want to call them. But at the same time, I think these movies have always kind of been a little bit wild at the end, open the Ark of the Covenant, and then what, like angry angels pop out, whatever is supposed to be happening at the end of Raiders that everyone melts. Like there's a thousand year old old man having a conversation with people. And so there's always been a certain wackiness to the finale of these movies. I, I think the, the the more bold and big it gets, the more that it, it reminds you that you're watching something that's like, this is pretty wild. I don't expect people to just fully reject it and roll their eyes at it the way they did with spaceships coming out of the ground, but I also don't think people will accept it the way they did a thousand year old night. Real quick, before I give you my final thoughts, remember to join me down below in the comment section. Let me know what did you think about Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Some people are loving it, some people are hating it. A lot of us are right there in the middle. I'd love to know what you thought about it. Also, I've been working to review each of the Indiana Jones movies 
tied to the release of this film. Several years back, I did a video on how to fix Kingdom of the Crystal Schools. It's something very different from me. So if you want to see an early video with a different flavor, check that out. And we'll have a ranking of the movies coming in just a couple of days. I think a big thing working against this film is expectations, which is to say for a lot of us, we've been watching that original trilogy our entire lives. And depending on your tastes, one, two, three of them you think are fantastic. And by comparison, it's tough to live up to both a fantastic movie made by a pair of top tier filmmakers in their prime. And so you just expect an Indiana Jones movie to always be way up here. So what happens when you get one that's good enough? Well, by comparison, it feels awful, but that doesn't mean it's actually awful. It doesn't mean it's actually terrible. You can have a movie that's both enjoyable, but deeply flawed. And that's what this feels like to me. A movie that it's good enough. It does a lot of things right. It's competent enough. But by comparison to three fantastic films, it just feels like it pales in comparison. I don't think we get anywhere close to many of the issues that we got with Kingdom of the Crystal Skulls, but we're also nowhere close to those movies up there. We are right there in the middle. And if you go in expecting Kingdom of the Crystal Skulls, you'll be pleasantly surprised. If you go in expecting Raiders Last Crusade, you'll be horribly disappointed. Go in expecting, it's nice to see Indy again, but there's gonna be some weird stuff in here. Overall, it's a B minus on the entertainment scale, a six out of 10. And you can probably wait to stream this one unless you're a diehard Indiana Jones fan, which no matter what, you were going to go see it opening weekend anyway. Remember, I'm working on those Indiana Jones reviews right over there. I got that video on how to fix Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Schools right down there. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies and TV too much. Bye bye.